Ukraine is planning to arm its citizens after a Russian invasion by land, air and sea. The European Union says Vladimir Putin has brought war back to Europe. More than 30 civilians have been killed in bombings by Russian forces. Dozens more have been injured. Ukraine's military is fighting back and says it has managed to kill nearly 50 troops near the eastern city of Kharkiv. We have correspondents in Kiev, Washington, Beijing and on the Russian border with Ukraine. Offer us a look at how this invasion unfolded. Before the crack of dawn, explosions rocked several parts of Ukraine as Russian forces advanced across the border. President Vladimir Putin ordered the military operation, calling it an act of self-defense. He said it aims to protect people who have been bullied and subjected to genocide by Kiev. Russian forces have fired a barrage of missiles at several cities. Troops have been moving in from Belarus in the north and Crimea in the south. Зараз нас атакують не лише бомби, але й фейки. Важливо отримувати правду з офіційних джерел. Сьогодні Росія розпочала вторгнення в Україну. Путін розпочав війну з Україною, з усім демократичним світом. Він хоче знищити мою державу. Він хоче знищити нашу державу. Усе те, що ми будували, заради чого живемо. Sirens echoed across the Ukrainian capital to alert residents of airstrikes. Panic, fear, worry, you know who to turn to for help. It's terrible, very terrible. We didn't expect it to come to such a situation. We heard the fires in the morning and everyone started to panic. Военное положи, а что а стать? Паника, что? Паника. Ну, всем страшно. Дети, дети, куда дети, детей девать? Страшно. Куда прятаться? Куда деваться на? Убежищ нету, ничего нету. Ровное место. Куда? Куда? Long lines of cars have been seen as hundreds of thousands try to flee the capital. Many also rush to underground metro stations to take shelter. Russia's invasion has been swiftly condemned by Western powers. The EU has vowed to hit Moscow with its harshest sanctions. We are facing an unprecedented act of aggression by the Russian leadership against a sovereign, independent country. Russia's target is not only Donbas. The target is not only Ukraine. The target is the stability in Europe and the whole of the international peace order. And we will hold President Putin accountable for that. Let's speak to our international desk editor, Jeremy Coe, for more. Jeremy, the Western world has taken a step-by-step -step approach as far as sanctions are concerned so far, leaving the strongest ones as a last resort. Now, with this ac acceleration that we're seeing, wide-ranging ones are now expected, but will they deter Vladimir Putin from further moves in Ukraine. Well, there are lots to unpack here at this moment because developments are still fast moving. Uh, but it's clear that sanctions and the mere threats of sanctions have not deterred Mr. Putin from uh, taking the course of action he's taken over the last few hours as well. Uh, because he probably, probably could have calculated that uh, the US as well as uh, the Europe has, you know, uh, would stop short of implementing the toughest measures because doing so would also inflict considerable pain to their own economies as well. Uh, countries are just recovering from the pandemic over the last two years and any sanctions imposed on Russia would further complicate any recovery efforts as well because Russia is also a uh, key supply of natural gas and oil. And also, uh, as we've seen over the last few years, with, not just with Russia, but with, with other countries as well, uh, sanctions have uh, rarely worked. Uh, take North Korea, for example. Uh, North Korea has had sanctions imposed of them for over uh, quite many years, uh, over the last few decades, in fact. And still, uh, it, it, it was meant to deter progress on the nuclear programs, but still we've seen um, they, they've made much progress over the nuclear program over the last few years. Uh, it's not stopped at all. 
And also, we've seen like skyscrapers in Pyongyang and so on. So clearly, sanctions have limited effect, especially if uh, the country involved has a way to circumvent all these sanctions. Now, for Russia, it could jolly well turn to China, its key ally, uh, if the West were to impose very tough sanctions on it. And uh, China, on its part, has also said that uh, Russia is a key ally. Mr. Xi, uh, in the last few weeks, has called uh, Mr. Putin his best friend as well. Uh, so with these in mind, uh, it's clear that sanctions have a limited effect, even though the West is talking about the toughest uh, sanctions they will impose on Russia in the coming days. Uh, Jeremy, uh, given uh, what you have just said about the limitations of sanctions, uh, what more then can be done? Boris Johnson coming on the last half an hour saying, Today, in concert with the Allies, we will agree a massive package of economic sanctions designed in time to hobble the Russian economy. So that's in time, hobble the economy. Of course, sanctions can take various forms. You can also look at export controls. What more can they do at this point? Well, if you're looking at it purely in terms of sanctions, uh, Mr. Putin has taken uh, steps over the last few years to try to insulate the $15 trillion uh, Russian economy from uh, sanctions, so that, that will have a limited effect. Of course, the West could start targeting oligarchs and hopefully by you know, san imposing sanctions on these oligarchs, uh, they would you know, pile pressure on Mr. Putin as well. Or they could take a more extreme step of imposing sanctions on Russian banks, key Russian banks, and that could have a more crippling effect on the Russian economy. But as I said earlier, imposing all these sanctions come at considerable cost to the Western economies as well. Uh, so as for what's next in Russia as well as Ukraine, it depends on what Mr. Putin's end game is. One, uh, we could have two scenarios. One, a more optimistic one, where he is only in Ukraine on a very limited military uh, excursion to you know, uh, gain control over the two separatist regions, Donetsk as well as uh, Lunetsk, and also to uh, demilitarize the rest of Ukraine and pro probably uh, bring about regime change or install a puppet government. Uh, but a more, you know, uh, pessimistic scenario would see uh, you know, Russia taking over Ukraine and an insurgency that stretches on for several years, as we've seen, you know, in the last major conflict in Europe in the 1990s when uh, the Balkans war erupted. Uh, so that stretched on for several years. So this could be what we see in uh, Ukraine and Russia as well. I oh, thank Jeremy. Jeremy, we're staying us for the rest of this program. Thank you. And Julia Chapman joins us live from Rostov-on-Don in Russia. Julia, uh, as we just heard uh, from our from Jeremy Cole, uh, we're all wondering what really is on Mr. Putin's mind. Of course, before this offensive, he made the unusual move of recognizing uh, the se two separate regions Donbar in the Donbass region. Uh, what is he trying to achieve in justifying this current offensive? Everybody is looking for clues as to what is going on in the mind of President Vladimir Putin. Many analysts who for weeks have been predicting that he couldn't possibly try to take control of the capital Kiev or attack it even, uh, are now being proven wrong. So certainly uh, it is difficult to know exactly where this goes. But given the extraordinary speech that he made to the Russian people in the early hours of this morning, we do have some clues. He says that he is trying to prevent a genocide in the Donbass. Uh, he said that it was necessary to take these steps, this special military operation that's now being carried out in order to protect people in Ukraine. Uh, so we understand now, as the day has unfolded, that his ambitions are not limited to the eastern Ukraine region. There have been attacks not only in Luhansk and Donetsk, but much wider across Ukraine, all the way to the country's west, including the capital, Kiev, where we've seen several strikes carried out against uh, military infrastructure, airports uh, in the neighboring areas around Kiev, as well as at least one residential building having been hit. We understand from the Ukrainian government that there are already dozens of casualties from just today's fighting. Uh, there are land incursions as well from the north and the south. So certainly this is proving already to be a much wider confrontation, uh, one that has enormous re repercussions and ramifications for both the Russian and the Ukrainian people. Now, Julia, Russian lawmakers unanimously authorize um, Mr. Putin to use military force in uh, Ukraine. But how do the people in Russia view the invasion? It is a very mixed picture and it isn't yet clear to what extent 
Russians uh, accept and approve of this particular move. Uh, there was, of course, a lot of support for bringing in evacuees from eastern Ukraine. There was even high support, if you believe state pollsters, for the recognition of the uh, independence of the Donetsk and Lugansk regions. According to Vitsyom, the state pollster, 73% of Russians approved of that move. But this is a very different step indeed. There are uh, regions of Ukraine being attacked by the Russian military. Uh, most Russians in the weeks leading up to this moment had told us they weren't interested in war. They did not want to see fighting break out between Russia and Ukraine, two countries which historically have been very, very close. Uh, there are people with family on both sides of the border. Undoubtedly, there are inextricable links between the two. And that is partly what is motivating President Vladimir Putin. But of course, if this spills out into a major conflict, Conflict with high numbers of casualties, that is going to be very difficult for the Russian people to accept. Uh, but President Putin seems to have taken that into account for his calculations and dismissed it as being any kind of a deterrent. Uh, thanks for that, Julie. Reporting live from Russia. U.S. President Joe Biden will meet G7 allies later today to come up with more severe measures against Russia. Simon Marks joins us live now from Washington, D.C. for more. Simon, White House sanctions regime, that's going to be a priority for Joe Biden this morning. He's going to support President Zelensky? Yes, absolutely. Going to support uh, Vladimir, Volodymyr Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, through thick and through thin. Indeed, overnight, uh, the White House put out a statement on behalf of President Biden saying, President Zelensky reached out to me tonight and we just finished speaking. Uh, this message pu put published by the White House press office about seven hours ago. I condemned this unprovoked and unjustified attack by Russian military forces. I briefed him on the steps we are taking to rally into national condemnation, uh, including last night's events, extraordinary as they were at the United Nations Security Council. And the statement goes on to say that President Zelensky asked President Biden to call on the leaders of the world to speak out clearly against President Putin's flagrant aggression to stand with the people of Ukraine. And the statement confirms that uh, with dawn now breaking here, President Biden uh, will be preparing to participate in that virtual G7 leaders meeting. It had already been put in the diary several days ago. They thought they were going to be talking about diplomatic efforts to defuse the crisis. Now, of course, they're going to be talking instead about the sanctions that they plan to implement and any other actions that they're going uh, to take to deal with what is an absolutely fresh national security crisis confronting President Biden this Thursday morning here in the United States off the back uh, of the national security crisis he had to deal with last August uh, in Afghanistan, prompted by the botched U.S. military withdrawal there. Well, Simon, given that Mr. Biden has said that the U.S. will not send troops to help Ukraine, what kind of further action can the U.S. take to force Russia's hand? Look, I think it's going to be very interesting to hear what President Biden has to say when he addresses the American people a little bit later on here today for several reasons. I mean, first of all, the White House has been absolutely implacable, as has President Biden in every message that he's given uh, to the American people over the last several weeks on Ukraine, that he is not putting American troops in harm's way in Ukraine itself and yesterday asked specifically what President Biden would do in the event that Vladimir Putin did launch the full-scale invasion that now appears to be playing out. What would the White House do were Vladimir Putin to oust President Zelensky from power? The immediate response at yesterday's White House press briefing from Jen Psaki, uh, President Biden's spokesperson, was to say that the United States and President Biden will not allow themselves to be drawn into war with Russia. So they're going to draw a distinction, the president and I suspect his G7 partners, between defending NATO's eastern flank, those uh, regions of NATO that uh, border uh, Russia and Russia's sphere of influence and so offend uh, President Vladimir Putin in Moscow. They're going to defend NATO 
as opposed to offering specific military commitments to Ukraine beyond the supply of lethal weaponry. And one reason why you can understand why President Biden is taking that approach is that even though it may result in President Zelensky's government uh, being toppled, I mean, we're not there yet, but there is clearly that possibility, President Biden can look at an opinion poll that was published here yesterday showing that only 26% of the American public believe the United States should play a major role in any conflict in Ukraine. A serious moment for Ukraine. Simon, thank you very much for that. Simon Marks in Washington, D.C. And from Beijing, Olivia Xiong joins us live. Uh, Olivia, uh, today's regular Minister of Foreign Affairs briefing, we've got the spokesperson rejecting a foreign journalist describing Russia's actions as an invasion. Why? Well, we see China really sticking to its position. It has chosen not to condemn Russia while also being very careful to see that it is not associated with this latest Russian military operation. So China has continued to call for a de-escalation of tensions and for restraint from all parties. At the foreign ministry briefing that you mentioned, there, there was quite a bit of a back and forth between the spokesperson and the foreign journalists when being pressed on whether China would consider Russia's actions an invasion. But uh, the spokesperson would only say that China is closely following the situation in Ukraine and call on all parties to exercise restraint and prevent the situation from getting out of control. We had also seen at the UN Security Council meeting China's representative there saying that the door to peace, had a, the door to a peace peaceful resolution, rather, has not been completely closed and should not be closed, adding that China welcomes efforts to solve the crisis with uh, diplomatic means. Now, Olivia, like it or not, China has been lumped into this conflict because of its ties with Russia. So what role is China likely to play in this crisis? <laughs> Well, we are expecting, uh, as analysts have said, for China to continue to stick to its position as it tries to balance its friendly relationship with Russia, especially as both countries face pressure uh, from the West. But also China very aware of its own territorial and sovereignty concerns, for example, when it comes to the self-ruled island of Taiwan. And we had just seen, um, you know, a news that Foreign Minister Wang Yi had held a phone call with his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, who said that the U.S. and NATO had broken uh, their commitments and con with its continued expansion eastward and refusing to implement the new Minsk agreement. And uh, the Russian foreign minister saying that Russia was forced to take necessary measures to protect their own rights. And this is a position that China has been in line with, uh, with Russia with. And uh, Mr. Wang in the phone call, also saying that China always respects the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all countries, but at the same time saying that China does understand Russia's legitimate security concerns. And we know that China is also extremely wary of the U.S., led arrangements, for example, the Quad or AUKUS, as it sees those arrangements as trying to contain China. Earlier, we also saw China's foreign ministry hit out at the U.S., accusing it of fanning the flames of tension in Ukraine, citing how the U.S. has sold arms to Ukraine, um, contrasting that with how it says China has acted responsibly. But having said that, China is also walking a fine line. It's also trying to distance itself from Russia. Have a listen. Chinese Foreign Minister, and uh, thanks for that, Olivia Xiong.